Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. Today, we will be continuing our series on Daenerys and trekking our way through her Dance with Dragons storyline in search of anything that might foreshadow the events that we saw transpire in the show. Specifically, this video will look at her sixth and seventh chapters, where we learn more about Danny and what she truly wants through some of the most poignant and deep insights into her psyche than we're given access to in the entire series. So, let's do this. Danny 6, the Dance with Dragons chapter, and 27th overall, begins after the arrival of the Astapori refugees. After hearing about the pain, suffering, and sickness that the refugees are dealing with, Danny insisted on going down to the camp to see it with her own eyes, in spite of the fact that her counselors practically begged her not to do so. Danny believes that a queen must know her people's suffering, and therefore would not be moved. Then, we learn from her inner monologue that Danny has done all that she could for the refugees by sending as much food and medical assistance as she could spare every single day. But despite these efforts, the bloody flux just kept galloping. As Danny looks about and sees a level of despair that's borderline unimaginable, she finds herself thinking, What kind of mother has no milk to feed her children? She feels powerless to help her people, so she does what she can, and after shaming her men into helping her make pyres for the dead, she returns to her pyramid. There, she was immediately reminded that she's supposed to meet with the Green Grace in Resnak to discuss preparations for her wedding to Hisdar. Here she agrees to wear their special wedding tokar and get married in the Temple of the Graces, but... Under no circumstance is she going to allow Hisdar's mother and sisters to inspect her female parts, nor will she wash Hisdar's feet unless he first washes hers, which, according to Reznak, is a ritual that's supposed to signify that her new role will be that of her husband's handmaid. In other words, the Green Grace seems to be trying to get Danny to essentially turn Marine back over to the Marinese through marriage. Then, she has dinner with Hisdar, who told her not to fret over these things, and goes on to tell her that he views the ancient customs of Marine as empty and unnecessary, and to prove his intentions, he agrees to wash her feet first. This is the first big hint that we get, that Hisdar and the Green Grace are at odds over the future of Marine. The Green Grace wants all these ancient customs upheld, and Hisdar thinks that they're pointless and are most likely holding Marine back. Then, he tells her about his latest correspondence with Yunkai and the terms they're willing to make peace under. Although he appeared to be quite pleased with himself, the terms of this peace are pretty much ridiculously one-sided. First, Marine, which will remain a slave-free city, must agree to pay the Yunkai a fortune in gold and gems to make up for the losses they incurred due to Danny's disruption of the slave trade. Second, Yunkai will resume the slave trade, unmolested. Third, Astapor will be rebuilt as a slave city, without interference from Danny. Fourth, Danny must take his dar for her husband so that he may rule beside her as king. So, Danny gets peace, and the city of Marine will be slave-free, while her enemies get everything they want. Danny eloquently sums it up when she said that essentially it boiled down to a wedding or a war, marriage or carnage. And Hisdar confirms that this is the reality of the situation. He did have a more positive attitude towards it, though. 
He seems to genuinely view this as an opportunity for them to make a new Marine together. He's explained his frustration with the old, stale ways of his city to Danny before, and he really appears to be chomping at the bit for the chance to remake Marine into a prosperous and modern city that isn't tied down by the shackles of ancient customs. This notion is further underscored by the fact that Hisdar doesn't seem to care in the slightest about what Danny has done to the slave trade. He appears to have business interests that go far beyond buying and selling slaves, and likely thinks his city's reliance on a single source of income is one of the main reasons they haven't moved forward. This vision of a new marine could also be what he had been speaking with the noble families about when he visited and spent hours in each of the pyramids. Danny is more reticent about the whole thing. She had no intention of staying in Marine indefinitely to build a new city with a Giscari husband and king beside her. She's quite understandably conflicted about the prospect of peace under these terms. It's going to cost her quite a bit. This peace places her in a position that will delay her dreams of Westeros for years, maybe even indefinitely. Perhaps a life dedicated to building a new marine wouldn't be as difficult a pill for Danny to swallow if it didn't require her to make moral concessions by turning a blind eye to the reinstatement of slavery outside her walls. But those were the terms, and they left a bitter taste in Danny's mouth. Before Danny could frame her reply, Barristan interrupts them to inform her that the Stormcrows have returned to the city with word of their foe and that Dario isn't at all interested in making his reports to him, as she commanded him to do. He tells her that Dario said that he would even write them in his own blood if she sent Missandei there to teach him how to make the letters. Danny's age and infatuation with Dario trumped reason here, and she apologizes to Hisdar for leaving him abruptly, which he did take in stride, and orders Barristan to assemble her officers and rushes off to beautify herself for her captain. In the end, she tried a dozen gowns before finding the one she liked, and refused to wear her crown, which is important to make note of and is something that we're going to be circling back to in a bit. Covered in blood, Dario kneels before her and tells her the tale of his fights with the Yunkish outriders, which now include Brown Ben Plum and his second sons. When he was done, the uproar in the hall was deafening until the queen spoke. She told them that the gates must be barred and closed. No one is to enter or leave. When Resnack asked her about what that meant with regard to the Astapori refugees, she wanted to scream, to gnash her teeth and tear her clothes, and beat upon the floor. Instead, she said, close the gates. Will you make me say it thrice? She commanded everyone to leave except Dario who she brought up to her chambers to have his wounds cleaned by her handmaids. When that was done, she dismissed them as well, and it is here that she begins the love affair that she had been yearning for since she first met the swaggering, blue-haired sellsword back on the road from Astapor to Yunkai. She pleaded with him to never betray her as Brown Ben had done, and he swore to her that he wouldn't. She believed him, and to be honest, I don't even think it was foolish. Dario seems to be completely in love with Daenerys, and has demonstrated complete loyalty to her and her cause since swearing her his sword. The last time they spoke, she basically flipped out on him and kicked him out, yet he returned anyways, and will kill any man who takes up arms against her, or even hints that they'd like to. Before we move ahead to the next chapter, we need to address some of what just took place here. This chapter is extraordinarily revealing and filled with things that appear to be breaking down Danny's resolve and making her feel powerless to do anything about the problems in Marine. The chapter begins with Danny facing the harsh reality of not being able to do everything she wished she could for the refugees camped outside her walls. And by the end of the chapter, She's in the heartbreaking position of needing to close her gates and leave them to their fates. Then, Hisdar presents her with Yunkai's peace terms, 
which require Danny to make substantial moral concessions and marry his daughter, which the Green Grace seems to want very badly, thinking that it will strip Danny of her power and transform her into nothing more than his daughter's queen. This piece also requires her to set aside her own dreams and desires. Learning of Brown Ben's betrayal and the ever-increasing strength of the enemy host is starting to make war seem a bleak option in this chapter as well. So, when a person feels powerless, isolated, and lacking any options to better their situation, what do they do? They shut down. They avoid. They escape. And that is exactly what we see happen with Danny in the wake of these events. She stops wearing her crown. She stops holding court. She becomes disillusioned with her own cause. She finds her escape through Dario, which actually turns out to be something that makes her decision between marriage and carnage all the more difficult to make. Many see these options as personified in Dario, signifying war, and his dar, peace but it's a lot more complex and layered than that. Earlier in the book, Danny had a dream about Dario, in which they were husband and wife, simple folk who lived a simple life and lived in a house with a red door. Danny has been chasing this dream all her life. It's what the house with the red door means to her. Simplicity, safety, security. Things she hasn't had since she was a child, living in the house with the red door with Willem Derry, looking out for her. She practically said as much to Miss Sande earlier in A Dance with Dragons, when she told her Sir Willem was the only person who ever kept her safe. Later, as she enjoys her last few nights with Dario, she thinks to herself that she'd give up being a queen in a second for a simple life with him. That's what this dream was really all about. And it's fitting that Dario is the one who's with her in the house with the red door in her dream. Because he's a man that would literally do anything to keep her safe. And he's been proving that since the day she met him. This safe and simple life with Dario also starkly contrasts the daily dose of complicated misery her life has become as the Queen of Marine. It might even give us a small glimpse of the life that Danny truly desires. Being the queen requires her to live and rule for her people. Their needs always come first, and what she wants and what would bring happiness to her life pretty much never even comes into play. Danny's a very loving and passionate young woman, so it seems logical that if she was just a normal person that didn't have the weight of restoring her family's dynasty thrust onto her shoulders, a life of love and passion with Dario would ideally suit her. And being someone who's never really had love or security, with the possible exception of the last few months that she spent with Drogo, it makes sense that these are the things that she desires. Then there's the distinct personality difference between the Danny we see now at this point in the story compared to what we had seen her grow into prior to her arrival in Marine, It all seems to stem from her decision to lock her dragons away, which resulted in her losing one of them as well. That seems to be the moment that the confidence that she had prior to Marine began dwindling, and we now see Danny regressing back to the scared little girl that we met at the beginning of the series. When she put two of her dragons in chains and lost the other, she essentially put herself in chains and lost the part of herself that truly defined her. When you go back to when she first came out of her shell, it was when she felt safe and secure with Drogo. This confidence continued to grow following the birth of her dragons, and then she got to Marine, where she lost her best advisor Jorah and abandoned her dragons. Spending time with Dario seems to be reawakening Danny's true self, though. But why? Well, part of it likely stems from the fact that when she's finally in the arms of Dario in this chapter, she notes that he smells of blood and smoke and horse. Since she associates with her family, blood and smoke, i.e. fire and blood. 
and horse, which likely reminds her of one of the last times she was happy, when she was with Caldrogo. Danny also tells Zaro that she thinks horses have an honest smell. So when you put it all together, Dario smells honest and familiar, which, combined with his obvious willingness to do whatever needs to be done to protect her, likely contributes to the fact that Danny feels safe and secure when she's around him. Then, when you add the meaning of Dario's name, and the symbolism associated with the devilish details George chose to associate with him, the question as to whether Dario is a good thing for Danny or not becomes a bit easier to answer. The name Dario is a derivation of Darius, and means to possess good. Naharis seems likely to have been derived from an Arabic name, Nahar, which means day. Dandelions are only mentioned twice in the entire series, and both times they include Dario. So, why dandelions? Well, as is the case with all flowers, dandelions are full of symbolism, including the healing of emotional and physical pain, emotional and spiritual intelligence, the warmth and power of the rising sun, surviving through all challenges and difficulties, long-lasting happiness and youthful joy, getting your wish fulfilled, and rising above life's challenges. Dario's presence in Danny's life has been a good thing, just like his name implies. He is the light in her life, and the dandelions he both wears and says he would pick for her are symbolic of the healing effect he has on her psyche. The fact that he brings her warmth, happiness, and joy, and is there to help her survive and rise above the challenges she faces. Additionally, Danny's relationship with Dario seems intended to mirror that of her mother's relationship with Sir Bonifer Hasty, whom Barrison tells Danny about in her seventh chapter. According to Sir Grandfather, Rayella and Bonifer fell in love, despite the fact that she was a princess and he was merely a landed knight. In the end, Rayella set aside her feelings for Bonifer and married Eris for matters of state, which is exactly what Danny does here. So besides the circumstances being virtually the same, we then asked ourselves if we could glean any further insight into Danny and Dario by looking at the details of Bonifer and Rayella. Well, names being important to George, we looked into what kind of name is Bonifer. Turns out it's not actually a name, but one George invented, so we broke it down. Bon means good. The second part, fur, is a combining form meaning that which carries. So George's invented name of Bonifer can literally be translated to mean that which carries good, which is basically just another way of saying to possess good, which is the literal meaning of the name Dario. In other words, the two names have the same meaning. But why does that matter? Well, after Rayella married Eris, Bonifer was never the same nor did he ever even attempt to find love or happiness again with another woman, as he felt that no one could ever compare to his long-lost love. Now, as hasty as this sounds, it does tell us that his feelings and devotion to Rayella were about as pure as it gets. And since George took great care to have Danny and Dario's relationship parallel that of Bonifer and Rayella, it seems safe to assume that Dario's love and devotion to Danny is the equal of Bonifers. This brings us full circle, back to our dream where she lives a loving, passionate, safe, simple, and secure life with Dario in a house with a red door. This dream seems representative of the factors that make Danny hesitant to accept this dog shit version of peace in Marine. It's not just this commonly accepted notion that Danny finds peace boring and likes the excitement of war. It's that this peace requires her to sacrifice the love, passion, safety, and security that she truly desires, and all she really gets for it is a slave-free zone inside the walls of Marine, and a marriage to a husband that will never make her happy and might potentially force her to spend the rest of her life in a city she doesn't want to live in. In other words, she has to give up everything she truly wants for almost nothing. 
Slaver's Bay will still be the epicenter of the slave trade. Astapor will be rebuilt, and as soon as it is, they'll start cutting little boys and make them strangle puppies and kill slave babies so they can turn them into brick eunuchs. Yunkai will continue taking little boys and girls and turning them into sex slaves. Even her apparent victory in Marine is hollow. The Maronese are still going to be slavers. They're just going to have to walk outside the gate to do so. Her freed men and women will essentially be prisoners in Marine, because if they dare to walk out one of the city's gates, it seems likely that they'll be taken and sold directly back into slavery. All she gets is a few square miles within the city limits of Marine that slavery will technically not exist, where her freed men and women will probably be paid so little that they can barely survive, especially once the Great Masters realize that slashing their wages won't drive them away because they can't leave. Everything Danny's fought for in Slaver's Bay will be undone. She risked all in an attempt to use her newly acquired power to bring some positive changes to the world, and set aside her own personal dreams and aspirations to do so, and accepting this offer for peace will mean that it was all for pretty much nothing, while at the same time condemning herself to a life without love or happiness. It's not just this overly simplistic Dario in war versus Hisdar in peace. It's about Danny wanting happiness for herself, and getting the opportunity to live at least some small part of her life for herself, and not just the men, women, and children that she freed from bondage, which is sort of personified in the contrasting types of lives that Danny will live based on her choice between Dario and Hisdar. Danny's seventh chapter expands on this a great deal. Danny and Dario's little affair ends up being every bit as passionate as she imagined it'd be, and she's so happy when she's with him that she doesn't even want to sleep and miss a single moment of the little time that remained to them. On one of their last nights together, while sleeping beside her captain, she has a dream where his dark kisses her, but his lips were blue, and his touch is cold as ice. Now, we don't think this is a prophetic dream, nor do we think that it signifies a hidden, sinister aspect of his dar, but rather what Danny associates with a life married to him. George has said, that fire is love, fire is sexual ardor, fire is passion, whereas ice is cold, ice is death, ice is betrayal and cold inhumanity. So Hisdar, having ice-like qualities in her dream, seem likely to be metaphorical for the type of life Danny thinks she would have with Hisdar, joyless and surrounded by cold inhumanity all in the name of this so-called peace. When he woke, Dario makes Danny promise that she'll hold court so he can fulfill his promise that he made to the Westerosi turncloaks he recruited from the Windblown, who have started wondering if she really exists. And after a long day of petitioners, Dario and company arrived. Among them are Quentin Martell and his companions who presented Danny with a pact signed by Willem Derry and Oberyn Martell, which promised Viserys to Ariane and an alliance between the Martells and Targaryens. After things nearly come to blows between Dario and Drink, she informed Quentin that she cannot marry him in place of her brother, as she is already set to wed his star. That was the last order of business in court that day, and when they left, Barristan tells her that Quentin's arrival changes everything, but Danny disagreed. Three swords won't help her in the situation she's currently in. That night, which is their last night together, Danny and Dario have a night to remember, getting it on every way they can think of to do it. When dawn comes, Dario is noticeably upset, and after he left, Danny notes that the fig that she was eating completely lost its savor now that he was gone. That's yet another example of George showing us that Danny is truly in love with Dario. This isn't just a childish fling, and Dario is in love with her too. So, Danny dons her floppy ears and sets out across the city to be married, 
hoping against hope that Daria will come and save her, like would happen in one of Sansa's stories. But it was not to be. They arrive at the Temple of the Graces. Hisdar washes her feet first, just like he said he would, and four hours later, they were man and wife. We kind of fast-forwarded through this chapter a little, but we did it so we'd have enough time to talk about something that blew our minds when we noticed it. After Danny tells Quentin that he's too late because she's marrying his dar the next day, she and Barristan have a private conversation, where Danny realizes that Quentin is the son's son that Quaith warned her about. In Quaith's warning, everything she warns her not to trust come in pairs. Kraken in Dark Flame, Lion in Griffin, the Sun's Son, and the Mummer's Dragon. Now, Victarion and Makaro are together, so them being paired together makes sense. Tyrion and John Connington were at least together when Quaith said this to her, so even though they never actually head to Marine, it still sort of makes sense. But why is Quentin paired with the Mummer's Dragon? This is something that has bothered us for a really long time. Because, as many of you know, I've always considered Aegon to be the most logical Mummer's Dragon candidate. Because he's Varys' dragon, and Varys is often referred to as a Mummer. But Quentin and Aegon are never anywhere near each other. And since Quentin's dead, they never will be. It wasn't until we realized that the Sun's Sun and the Mummer's Dragon were actually together in the same room at the same time in this very chapter that it finally made sense to us. And it just so happens that George seems to have dropped a pretty big hint when he actually placed the two of them together in the text. The sun's sun. A shiver went through her. Shadows and whispers. What else had Quaith said? The pale mare and the sun's sun. There was a lion in it, too, and a dragon. Or am I the dragon? We read that dozens of times before it finally clicked, that Danny has become the Mummer's dragon. She isn't literally a fake, but she locked two of her dragons up and lost the other. She's reverting back to the scared little girl that she was before she had her second dragon dream. At this point, She's no more a dragon than her brother Viserys ever was. She's locked the true dragon lord away. She's become a sheep in dragon's clothing. And Quaith is trying to tell her not to trust this mummer's dragon she's become. And remember who she is.